been lingering outside here in sight of the door for minutes now. My heart is racing, but I'm paralyzed by fear. I don't know what awaits me inside, and I don't want to go in. The crowds push past me. They neither know nor care who I am, but once I'm inside, all that will change. I have to face my future, if I actually have a future. No, I cannot wait any longer. I offer up a prayer to God, and I enter. Why, Mr. Gray? <laughs> you look surprised to see me. It's been quite a while, monsieur. Shall I see if, by any chance, your favorite table is free? Any table will do. I understand. Is Monsieur alone? Someone may be joining me, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Of course, Monsieur. Please follow me. The table he is going to lead me to will be in the farthest, most secluded corner of the whole Café Royal. Maybe he wants to protect me and give me the privacy I need. But you should never trust the friendliness of a waiter. Maybe he wants to parade me across the whole Café Royal as a sacrificial victim. All eyes are upon me, and my heart is beating fast. That's John Gray. They're saying Oscar Wilde's model for Dorian Gray. And you know what that implies? How sad it is, murmured Dorian Gray. I shall grow old and horrible and dreadful, but this picture will remain always young. If it was only the other way, if it was I who were to be always young and the picture that were to grow old, for this, for this, I would give everything. Are you feeling unwell, monsieur? Uh, not at all. Why? Your table is just over here. Oh, uh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. Just look. Look. There was a time when I rather enjoyed this attention. Men used to give me envious glances because they'd all heard about a scandalous new novel, a novel called The Picture of Dorian Gray. They all knew that Dorian Gray beautiful young man, was granted his desire to look eternally youthful, except that in the attic his portrait was rotting away, reflecting how evil and corrupt he had become. And now, because of the trial, they turn away as I pass by, and I can only sense their hostile stares burning into my back. I hope this table is acceptable, monsieur. Oh, perfectly acceptable, thank you. And I think you said you're expecting someone to join you? Maybe. Uh, I can't say. Why? So that I could direct him to this table. I'm sure he'll be able to find me, if he does arrive. Of course, monsieur. No doubt they all think I'm without shame in coming here. How can they know it's not my choice of meeting place? How can they guess how much anxiety it costs me to sit here? I want to stand up and shout out that I broke with Oscar more than two years ago and I can accept no responsibility for his humiliation and imprisonment. Would you like to order now, monsieur? I beg your pardon? Something to drink, perhaps? Uh, what do you suggest? I recall monsieur always enjoyed a small bottle of Niersteiner with soda water. You remember that about me? <laughs> it's my job, monsieur. Do you remember everything? Of course not, monsieur. Nobody would wish to remember everything, and some things are best forgotten completely. Eh? Oh, yes, it's always good to be discreet. Mm. So bring the Niersteiner and the soda water. And food, or do you wish to wait for your guest? Tell me what I enjoyed eating for lunch when last I was here. You enjoyed the cold roast beef, very underdone. Mm. Forgive me, Mr. Gray, if you will remember otherwise. No, no. Um, Bring me the cold roast beef. Very good, monsieur. Karma. Now I'm seated and alone, I stare into the mirror which faces me. 
I study my face to see how it has been affected by the strains of the last few weeks. I have no portrait in the attic, so everything I have undergone will be reflected in my face. I am pale, and there are dark shadows under my eyes, but no, I, I don't look bloated and debauched as Oscar has come to look. I'm 29, but no, I, I still look younger than that. There's no doubt about it. Narcissus gazed at his image and fell in love with it. I am not in love with my image. I don't gaze at myself all the time, but I'm very accustomed to seeing others gaze at me as if I were a classical vision brought to life. I can't explain my looks. My father was an inspector of stores at Woolwich Arsenal who drank himself to death to my eternal relief. And my mother, she loved me, but her looks were no more than ordinary. The same is true of my siblings. My looks are a God-given gift to me alone. Except just now, forgive me, Lord. It feels more like a curse. You are near Steiner, monsieur? And the soda water? Uh, uh, don't pour it. I'll do that myself. Very good, monsieur. <laughs> the problem here is that the mirror doesn't simply give back my own reflection. There are mirrors everywhere, and my face appears in ever redoubling and confusing images. The Café Royal is a vision of gilding and crimson velvet in the French style. A riot of plaster caryatids appear to support a ceiling filled with vague Baroque deities. The fumes of tobacco are everywhere and rise up to this painted and pagan ceiling like incense burned to strange gods. The strange gods that presided over all our lives when we were under Oscar's sway. Your face can dissolve looking into this eternity of mirrors. You are stared at and you stare back. But somehow you never know who is really staring at you and who is not. And what is really happening and what is not. Dorian. I hear this voice and I look into the mirror. And by my shoulder stands Lord Henry, confident, mature an aristocrat with the unchallengeable confidence of the truly privileged. A handsome man once, before his way of life registered all too clearly on his vein-lined face. I do hope I didn't startle you, Dorian. I, uh, I just didn't know you were here. I saw you arrive. <laughs> Rather courageous of you, I thought, in the circumstances. Uh, may I join you, or are you expecting someone? No, please join me for a while. Perhaps you'd care to share this bottle of Nierstein. Oh, why not? It's a pleasant enough wine. I've always been very fond of it. Then I will join you in a glass, if I may. Dorian. Please stop calling me that. You quite liked it in the old days. Those days are gone. <clears throat> a cigarette? No, thank you. If you don't mind, dear John. Have some wine. Mm. No soda water for me. He lights his cigarette slowly and gives me an appraising look. He's in no hurry, but I know that look. Once at a supper party, he leant across and whispered in my ear that he would like to go to bed with me. It was lightly done, with grace and without pressure. And there's no denying it, I was flattered and I agreed. But I promised myself never to do it again. Not with Lord Henry, that is. This is a bad business. Very bad business. Oscar's been a complete fool. He should never have started libel proceedings against Queensbury, who's as mad as a hatter. Oscar may be clever and he may be witty, but he was lying all the time, and so it all came out. All those rent boys he used, and all those deluded young men with literary ambitions he abused. The result? Nobody's safe now. The world's in a moral panic, and we'll all have to live with the consequences. Lord Henry appears so calm, but the hand which is holding his cigarette, I suddenly notice, is shaking. He is afraid. Your good health. And yours. 
I think you were very lucky. In what way? Your name was never mentioned. Why should it be? Oscar was infatuated with you before he met Queensbury's son. I hated what was happening to Oscar. Success ruined him. I simply wanted nothing further to do with him. If you say so. But I do know what you mean. I'm very glad my name wasn't mentioned. So did you pay a lawyer to keep a watching brief on your behalf? That's what I did, just in case. Yes, I paid a lawyer too. If I had been mentioned, I would have had to act fast. Clever boy, but then you always were. I remember what you did when the rumours that you were Dorian Gray were starting to become embarrassing two years ago, three, when you'd had enough of all the glory of being that deliciously tarnished Adonis. You asked Oscar to make a denial, and he did. He wrote to the press saying that he'd only met you after he'd written the book, and there'd been a terrible misunderstanding. It was good of him to do that. Particularly as it was a lie. But then Oscar quite enjoyed lying. I think he always thought he was so much cleverer and wittier than other people that they'd never find him out. So very Irish of him. But sadly for all of us, he didn't prove as clever as he thought he was. In the end, you've turned out to be much cleverer. I'm not that clever. That's not how I see it. So how do you see it, Lord Henry? Yes, he is afraid. But he still belongs to a class which has power and confidence as a birthright. He stubs his cigarette out, and I await his verdict. He relishes the fact that I am waiting like an anxious manservant who may have laid out the wrong set of clothes for a particular event. Hmm. Perhaps I was ungenerous about the near Steiner. I thought it occupied a place very near the bottom of the wine list here in terms of quality. Not only price, but maybe I should reconsider. Stop tormenting me. Ah, I forgot. I'm intruding. So, may I ask whom you are expecting? No, you may not. You've not changed. You give when you want to, and you refuse when you want to. Please tell me. What do you want to say? I think I want to talk about the picture of John Gray. You have to hand it to Oscar. It doesn't have the same ring as the picture of Dorian Gray, does it? So, why don't you look in the mirror? Well, I am looking in the mirror. In this cafe, there's no choice. No, really, look into the mirror. Let's talk about who you really are. Lord Henry has multiplied in mirrors as he talks. The bloodshot but still searching eyes stare at me not only directly but from every angle. The truth is, you are a remarkable self-creation. I thought that when we lay naked between the sheets of my apartment in the Albany and we finally talked. I'd always known that somewhere behind your exquisite voice lurked delicate hints of cockneydom. I have never denied my origins. Nor should you, though few would think to inquire, because the performance is so perfect. Your social progress has been remarkable. Mm, I've worked hard to get where I am. No, honestly, I admire you. You turned yourself from a working-class victim boy into an exquisitely dressed young man who is acceptable everywhere. In a way, it's a debt I owe to my father. He hated me. And I hated him back. Mine too. He punished me with public school and a dutiful wife. You don't understand. How could you? When I was 12, I wrote an essay on the subject of cruelty to animals. It won me a scholarship to a grammar school and I could finally escape from everything I hated. But my father forced me to go and work in the workshops of the Woolwich Arsenal instead. Keep on looking I, into that mirror. I was trapped in a dirty, noisy factory working long hours. I was desperate to escape and I, I forced myself to study and study mathematics, French, German, drawing, painting, everything. Hmm. At 16, I passed the civil service exams and my father could no longer stop me. And still I studied and studied. I was determined. And when I was 22, I was appointed to a job in the Foreign Office. Where you could have settled into a dull, worthy existence and hidden your exquisite face away until you collected a handsome pension. I wanted more. And still do. You think so? Keep looking. Uh, no, keep looking. You're not Dorian Gray, some effete creation of Oscar's warped imagination. You've got a tough core and a strong instinct for self-preservation. 
Given your origins, you could easily have been there in court. Lined up with all those working-class rent boys Oscar used, been part of all that sordid talk about the state of the soiled sheets and what the maid did and didn't see. And like them, after their day in court, you could have sunk back into the obscurity from which you came. Then, as your looks faded, you would have lost the ability to make that extra money which made your dreary life just about tolerable, and in all probability you'd have drunk yourself to death. Like my father. And mine. But you're very different. You're one of us. And of course, a published poet. <clears throat> You're called roast beef, monsieur? Uh, thank you. Uh, can I fetch you anything, my lord? Uh, just leave us alone, will you? Very good, my lord. Mm. Of course, I'm probably one of the very few people who could afford to buy a copy of Silver Points and actually wanted to. Such a satisfyingly decadent volume, an exquisite binding, and a tiny rivulet of text running its way down a page of white paper of the highest quality. Doubtless paid for by persons unnamed. It wasn't Oscar. Did I say it was? The fact is, my dear Dorian, you can't just step back and pretend the current scandal has nothing to do with you. I'm not going to pretend that I've not written what I've written. Well, that's an intriguing statement. What do you mean? Because I possess a letter from you, signed... Dorian, well before Oscar claimed to have met you. I can't be the only person in possession of a letter like that. So, anybody who wanted to make your life difficult and implicate you in Oscar's downfall would have an easy time of it. You wouldn't do that? Of course not. It would be foolish, because I would be implicated too. But other people, financially needier people, might be less scrupulous. Whatever happened to that rather serious young man you used to go around with? I forget his name. Was it Alan? Very keen on music. I always seemed to be bumping into the pair of you at concerts. Living well beyond his means, or so I'd heard. I've not seen him for ages. Not since I broke with Oscar. So it wouldn't be him you're waiting for? I have no definite appointment with anybody. Well, I can't force you to tell me anything. But panic has entered our tight little world. And I may know things that you don't. We're all in the business of self-preservation now. And I really do want to help you. In what way? Come with me to the continent tomorrow. You're asking me to go away with you? I don't think you've fully grasped that it's all over. You may have been clever enough to escape the scandal so far, but you'll always be looking over your shoulder. You may have broken with Oscar, but you've not broken with the tastes you learned in his circle. What do you mean by that? Well, you may not have chosen to return to my bed, but from what I've heard, you've hardly been living the life of a celibate in the last couple of years. That is none of your business. Listen to me. There's very little time. I have good friends in Rome and Florence. England is no longer safe for any of us now. We've all been tarred with Oscar's brush. Lord Rufford and the Earl of Caversham left yesterday. My passage is booked for tomorrow. And if you wish, your passage could be booked too. Why should I wish? The old times are gone, never to return. And you will never be safe now the mad Marquis and his moral majority have started a witch hunt against us all. We're all guilty as charged. <laughs> These must be strange times if you think this is an invitation I would accept from a man like you. John, I... I don't think you fully understand the power your beauty exerts upon us. You would be safe with me. I have money enough and contacts enough. But I have a career. You don't seem to grasp that. A career so long as you deny your true nature and start making some very severe economies. Nobody can dress, dine and go to the theatre as you've been doing on the salary of a foreign office librarian. You fought hard to get there, but it was never enough for you, was it? Was it? You talk as if I have no other alternatives. Are we talking about Andrei Rafalovich, that odd-looking Russian Jew? Don't talk of him in that way. My dear John, I know he's very rich and he wanted to be an important literary figure. But as Oscar said... I know. 
He said that Andre wanted to start a salon and ended up running a saloon. <laughs> it was funny the first time. But it's th repeated because it represents a truth. Oh, did he fund your publication? Does he fancy he owns your exclusive rights? Or perhaps he doesn't know about your musical friend? This is offensive. I'm sorry, but Andre Rafalovich is preposterous. And the whole of London laughs at his pretension. Oh, my God, have you turned Catholic? What do you mean? Because I'm told that the ridiculous Andre has become obsessed with turning to Rome and abandoning the faith of his Jewish fathers. If he's bankrolling you, then you'll have to do what he asks. I don't wish to discuss this. Apparently, it's become something of a family trait. They queue up to deny their heritage. You're building on sand, Dorian. How can you trust yourself to somebody as neurotic and temperamental as him? I'm all too aware that present circumstances are creating a tidal wave of speedy conversions to Rome. I'm sure all the bells and smells and costumes make it so much more exotic and sensual than our own dear, dull, unexciting Church of England. But I still think it's only fear and guilt that's driving you all there. I have embraced the Catholic faith, but... But are you going to tell me it's a whim? We are all seeking for something in our lives that means more than the moment. So is this why you affect indifference to all that's happened? You think he'll keep you secure? How can you be the lover of a man who looks like that? We love each other. We are not lovers. <laughs> I'm prepared to believe you. Andrei Rafalovich is nobody's idea of a handsome man, so I'm quite sure you've kept him entranced without letting him anywhere near your bed. But men like him are dangerous. It's not your body he has designs on. It's your soul. Lord Henry. No, 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 no. You know I'm right. He wants to control your being in the name of God the Father, Mary, Mother of God, and all the rest of the heavenly crew. You'll deny your true nature and end up an incense-sniffing eunuch. It doesn't have to be that way. Come with me. Join our circle abroad. You'll be able to indulge all your appetites without fear of the world. I will not go with you. I've learnt to distrust your world. I don't want to be displayed around the hotels of Europe until my looks start to fade and I'm ever so politely discarded. If I did that, I would be one with Oscar's rent boys. The same fate, but in a, a much better class of hotel. I won't be here tomorrow, and neither will my offer. It cost me a great deal to come here and make it, but I meant it, every word. You want me to be grateful? When I thought you might listen to reason, but not any more. I want you to suffer because of who you are and what you've become. I want you to regret for the rest of your life that you didn't escape with me, because the opportunity is now gone, never to return. I will use my class, my money, and my privilege to have a very civilized time till the storm dies down. You're a good-looking, working-class boy who made himself into something he isn't. And though you've, you've climbed the greasy pole, you can very easily slip down it again, particularly once your looks are gone. And I wouldn't rely on Andrei Rafalovich to stay interested either. The self-made can very easily self-destruct. <sighs> He's no longer there. I can't even see his image in the countless mirrors. Look, I am alone again the object more than ever of whispers and stares. Lord Henry guessed correctly, I am waiting for Alan. We carried on meeting discreetly long after I'd broken with Oscar, but then the trial started and I panicked. I didn't handle the breakup well, and I know I hurt Alan badly, and now I am dreading what he will have to say to me in return. He's desperately short of money, and I know he holds letters from me signed Dorian Gray. How often recently I've woken up bathed in sweat full of dark dreams and thought that in the end there is only one way. A desperate way to create a clean slate. John. John. I've been so worried, I've been looking everywhere for you. I stare again into the mirror, and there, beside my shoulder, stands not my expected guest, but Andrei Rafalovich, pale and anxious, but with real affection in his eyes. It's a blessed relief after Lord Henry's poison. But then what if Alan now turns up as well? 
I couldn't believe it when they told me you'd come here. Why? It's the eye of the storm. Were you meeting somebody here? Is that why you came? Andre, please, I'm... I'm tired. I don't want to talk about it. But don't be angry with me, John. I was concerned about you. These are terrible times. Mm. So everyone keeps saying. But it doesn't become truer by saying it over and over again. We're all driving ourselves insane. I'm sorry, John. It's got nothing to do with you, Andre. It's just I thought... Oh, you look disappointed. You'd like it to be something to do with you. Don't be ridiculous. Poor Andre. He's the poor little rich boy who can't believe anybody can love him for what he is. Actually, I do love him for what he is. He's sometimes absurd, but he's held on to his spiritual beliefs, even in these cynical times. He really does care for my soul. But then maybe Lord Henry is right, and he also wants to own it. Lord Henry was here just now. Lord Henry? Is that why... He just happened to be here. I didn't come here to meet him. So, what was he saying? The things you'd expect him to say. Oh, he's always been a bad influence on me. I you. wouldn't say he's ever influenced me at all. But he liked to, especially now. Please, don't worry, Andre. But of course I worry. We're all at risk just now, but you more than the rest of us. Because you are... Dorian Gray. It's more complicated than that, of course, but... Yes. You have to be rescued from the stigma of Oscar's badly written novel and its catchpenny plot. He, he has come close to destroying you. I'm so glad I was able to save you from his influence. I searched the mirrors intently for any indication that Alan has arrived. So, did it mean anything? What? When you went into that Breton church years ago and declared yourself a Catholic. Well, of course it must have meant something. Well, it's just that I keep thinking about it. Particularly now, when so much else is in doubt. It was completely unplanned. I was on holiday with a foreign office friend, just a friend, visiting his family, and there was the church. And you were moved by it? It was an untidy, neglected place, and the priest wasn't much better. An unshaven figure slovenly and in a hurry. But you still went ahead. You know I did. Oh, I've always cherished the moment when you told me about that revelation. It's a bond between us. Of course. But maybe more significant for you than for me. I don't believe that's true. Then what about your own conversion? I am thinking and praying and waiting for the right moment. The superficiality of the lives we have all been leading is so very clear now. There has to be something finer ahead for all of us. I understand it's a far bigger decision for you than for me. You'll be abandoning a faith, however nominal it was in your life. I had no faith to abandon. But it wasn't a whim. I don't believe that for a moment. You should have heard Lord Henry. Oh, I'm profoundly glad I didn't. <laughs> he has no understanding of spiritual matters. His cynicism sickens me. I'd like some of your water. Could you eat some of my roast beef? Oh, I can't even look at it. Lord Henry wanted me to go away with him to the continent. And? Of course I refused. Well, there's no of course about it. He's a persuasive man. He's a poisonous man. The two aren't necessarily contradictory. Of course you were tempted. He carries an authority, a confidence. An outsider like me can never aspire to Andre, it. please. No, listen to me. I'm rich, but I will never be fully accepted by English society, however polite they are to my face. Oscar should have understood. He was an outsider too, but he humiliated me. You were there. He turned up at my house for lunch with some friends. When my butler answered the door, Oscar said, we'd like a table for six, please. It was unforgivable, but he has been punished. Heavily punished. Oh, I, I can forgive him and pray for him, but not Lord Henry and his kind. Of course, wealth does mean one can be generous to friends in need and support talented writers who deserve publication. In your case, the two are one. Andre, trust me, I am not going to the continent with Lord Henry. But I'm not going. Thank you. Maybe some wine after all. Or are you keeping it for someone else? No, no. You're sure? Please, drink. Your good health, John. Thank God you never call me Dorian. I would sooner die.
Does he guess somebody else might have been drinking this wine with me? Or how close I have been to this other until a couple of months ago? And immediately, I have a memory of one night soon after I met Alan when we came back to my flat after a concert. We drank champagne, and I sat on the sofa, and he sat on the floor and rested his head in my lap. And I ran my fingers through his fine, dark hair and took in the scent of the bittersweet pomade he'd rubbed into it. We were so at peace with each other. And now he is my potential enemy. We have to consider our future. Our future? You're sure of that? More sure than I've ever been of anything. I only wish I had the courage to publish my book here and now in English when what it has to say is so hugely relevant. Somehow it, it seems cowardly to be only talking to publishers in France. You said it yourself. These are dangerous times. Perhaps. But there is so much in what I have to say which applies to all of us just now. And, of course, to us in particular. I, I really do believe there are different sorts of love between men. There is the crude physical kind which Oscar chose, and chose is the right word. He did not need to do the things he did. He could have stopped himself. Are you sure? Oh, yes. He should have stopped himself. He could have stopped himself, just as we must stop ourselves. In my mind's eye, I see my hand moving down to caress Alan's face and then reaching down to loosen his collar as my lips find his. John, as you know, as we both know, there is another sort of love. A love which is about a spiritual bond, not a physical desire. A higher feeling between men, but between human beings, which leads us towards God. In times like these, we have to remember how important that is. I come from a family locked in misery and distrust. My mother could no more show affection for me than scatter banknotes from an upstairs window to the people passing below. <laughs> but patterns can be broken. If we embrace the church, the true church and its teachings, then we can find our way there. The two of us together. I'm still not sure I'm ready, Andre. Unless you can see the future more clearly than I can. My dear John, strange though I know you think me, I do believe I can see the future. I wish I could. But you must see it. You've rejected Oscar's world. You loathe Lord Henry as I do. Your work in the Foreign Office is soulless and they will never allow you to climb further up the ladder. We've talked of this before. But I've never believed you should. With your spirit and your imagination and your sensitivity, you must become a priest. A priest? A Catholic priest? The idea had hovered just below the surface in so many of our conversations, like a bee buzzing against a closed window pane. And now, finally, it is out in the open. I've always been defensive and claimed my conversion was just a momentary impulse. But that isn't true. It came from a deep need, and though I pushed that need aside, it has come to the fore again in my thoughts and in my prayers. After all, I offered a prayer when first I entered here. And now, finally, the thought has been put into words. The working-class boy from Woolwich who made himself into Dorian Gray needs to change himself again. But whose vision is this? Is it really mine, or is it mainly Andre's? I could help you in every way to achieve that. I know there's part of you that longs for something more transcendent. That longing is there in your poetry. I am right, am I not? Part of me, but... But? To achieve anything, you have to discard things which are valuable to you. But every time you deny something, something dies and can never be reborn. You mean you regret turning Lord Henry down? Of course not. That's not what I'm saying. Don't worry. 
We will go to the continent anyway because we all need to dissociate ourselves from the evil that has engulfed us. So we are all in flight. But we will go in a very different spirit. We will go in order to enter a retreat to study and to pray. How can we be sure we are not simply in retreat? God will surely guide us. I see a glorious future, John. John? What's the matter? In the mirrors, I see Alan walking towards us, his face pale and anguished. I wonder what I will do when he comes to our table and Andre is here. What will he say? What will he do? And will he have in his pocket those letters signed Dorian Gray? John, you've suddenly gone pale. Are you ill? And then I look again. And it's not Alan at all. It's somebody vaguely like him who joins a table close by. And I don't know whether I'm relieved or disturbed. Of course, you've heard about Alan Campbell. Heard what? It wasn't him you were expecting, was it? Was it? I don't know whether to expect him or not, but he did send me a telegram yesterday asking to meet me here. Then you don't know. What? He killed himself last night. Sliced a razor across his throat. Oh my God. The images in front of me fragment in a way I... I cannot grasp. I had prepared myself for a confrontation. He would show me the letters I had written to him, signed Dorian. I would be at his mercy. He would try and turn our love into guilt and into money. But he wasn't looking for revenge. He was looking for help. Because he had nothing else left. He could have been me. I could have been him. And he cut his throat. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings. You're absolutely sure? Read tomorrow's newspapers. I wish it wasn't true. I know that at one time the two of you were quite close. We'd grown apart, but still that this is uh, a, a, a terrible shock. I should have helped him. What could you have done? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saddened by the fact that he felt he had nothing to live for. He must have felt trapped. So very trapped. And he couldn't find a way forward. Andre, where are, where are you? I, I can't see you, Andre. Please. Suddenly, Andre is no longer there. Tears run down my face. My food is in front of me, the bottle of wine nearly empty. But he has disappeared. I search for him in the infinity of mirrors, but I can't see him. The moment has come. The moment of decision I can never retreat from. The voices of Lord Henry and Andre still argue in my head. They battle with the memories of Alan and the golden times we had when I was still Dorian Gray. The memories couldn't save him from self-destruction. What can save me? And I think of Dorian Gray looking at his portrait. It was an unjust mirror, this mirror of his soul he was looking at. He would destroy it. Why had he kept it so long? He would kill the past, and when that was dead, he would be free. Dorian seized a knife and stabbed the canvas, ripping the thing right up from top to bottom. There was a cry heard and a crash. The cry was so horrible in its agony that the frightened servants woke. When they entered, they found hanging upon the wall a splendid portrait of their master as they had last seen him, in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty. Lying on the floor was a dead man in evening dress with a knife in his heart. He was withered, wrinkled and loathsome of visage. It was not till they examined the rings that they recognized who it was. I looked down at the beef, cold but still blood red, but no, I am not Dorian Gray, I am John Gray, and I have not come this far to destroy myself. Suicide is a terrible sin. So I must look into the mirror yet again. Yes, my face.
face is still handsome, still remarkably young. But for how much longer? Everything around me has become oddly quiet, oddly still. And then I become aware of a face in the mirror watching me intently. The face is not unhandsome, but middle-aged and bloated with a sour, angry quality to it. I return its gaze. And then I realize that the face is within the mirror. There is no physical presence to it. I raise my glass towards this figure in the mirror and then my blood runs cold. The figure holds a glass in its hand and its gesture mimics mine. I take a drink, the figure takes a drink, I put down my glass, it puts down its glass. It is acting as a mirror image of myself. When I lean forward to look closer, the lined, guarded face leans towards me too. I am Father John Gray. I left my position in the Foreign Office and at the age of 32 entered the Scots College in Rome to study for the priesthood. I was ordained in 1901 and I served as a priest in a poor, working-class parish in Edinburgh. Despite my origins, I felt little affinity with my congregation. I had a breakdown, and when I recovered, I moved to the richer parish of St. Peter's in Edinburgh, where I remained for the rest of my life. Andre settled nearby and helped finance a new church, which we planned and built together. We also bought up as many copies of Silver Points as we could to remove it from circulation. We maintained a chaste, almost formal, relationship, though we were emotionally and spiritually very close. I lived for only four months after his sudden death in 1934. I don't expect to be told that you were always happy and content, because no one is but in your heart of hearts, we were at peace. I was not unhappy, but sometimes I felt as if I were to relax for a single moment. Only God knows what might happen to me. Shall I take the roast beef away, monsieur? Uh, yes, uh, by all means. Do you require anything else, monsieur? No. Nothing. I sit here in the cafe alone now, and I ask myself again, what is to happen to me? I offer up a prayer for guidance, but something tells me that I've already seen the answer. In The Shadow of Dorian Gray by Stephen Wyatt, John Gray was played by Blake Ritson, Lord Henry by Nicholas Farrell, and Andre Rafalovich by Joshua Maguire. The waiter was Chris Pavlo, and the voice of the novel was Mark Edelhunt. The director was Abigail Le Fleming. <laughs>